Hello, and welcome to the Neural Basis of Memory. Fun, huh? Okay, what we're going to look at today is the role of the neuron. First of all, how it works, and then second of all, what role does it play in memory? Okay, so we struggled through this a little bit in class, um, but hopefully I found some videos to add on to you this so that you can um, get a good understanding. So, here we go. All right. First of all, the major parts of the neuron. You guys did notes on this, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Um, the neuron sends and receives information. That's pretty clear, hopefully by now. And we have lots of different types of neurons, focusing today on the neurons in the brain. Okay, so the structure of a neuron. What's in it? Well, we have the soma. Remember, soma, ancient Greek for body. If you don't know that by now, well, I'm going to hunt you down and I'm going to tattoo it on your forehead. Don't show this video to your parents. Um, that is the major part. This soma determines whether or not the neuron reaches ac action potential. Okay, You're going to find out what that word means in a minute. We don't really need to know what action potential is. You just need to know if a neuron reaches action potential, then it fires, which means it sends a message. Okay. The soma and the nucleus in the soma decide whether or not there is enough neural energy to make that happen. Okay. You also have the dendrites. Remember we used kind of looks like your forearm. The dendrites are at the top. They receive the information. Then you have the cell body. Okay. Um, after that, the information then goes down the axon, which is like your actual forearm. Okay. Once it's gone through the axon, it then goes into the axon terminals, okay, which is where we have our terminal buttons, which almost connect to the dendrites of the next neuron. You also have the synaptic knob, or the presynapse, where your neurotransmitters, your chemicals, or your vesicles are stored so that that information can be transferred from electric information to chemical information. And that's why the process is called electrochemical. Okay, it's really important that we remember that. Here is the structure of a neuron. You can see it here. We have the dendrites. Okay, that is the cell body just there. And the nucleus. Okay, we also have the axon running through here. All right, you can see the myelin sheath. As I told you guys in class, the myelin sheath aids with conductivity, so how quick the message can get through the axon. The more messages that go through the axon, the more myelination, or the, the thicker the myelin sheath. Okay? Then it heads out there, you can see the axon terminals at the end there where it says to the next neuron. Okay? Here's another slide. You have this slide. I'm not going to show you this. I'm going to show you a video which I think explains this a little bit better. Communication between two neurons begins when an electrical impulse called an action potential travels along the axon of a presynaptic neuron toward the axon terminal. The action potential cannot cross the synaptic space. When it reaches the axon terminal, it causes membranous sacs called vesicles to move toward the membrane of the axon terminal. The membrane of the vesicle fuses with the membrane of the axon terminal, enabling the vesicle to release its contents into the synaptic space. The molecules released from the vesicles are chemicals called neurotransmitters. They drift across the synaptic space and bind to special proteins called receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. The binding of a neurotransmitter to its receptor can trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. That electrical signal then moves toward the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. Now that the neurotransmitter has relayed its message, it releases from the receptor into the synaptic space. Some of the neurotransmitter is degraded by enzymes in the synaptic space, and some of the neurotransmitter is carried back into the presynaptic neuron through transporter proteins. The neurotransmitter that is taken back up into the presynaptic neuron is then repackaged into vesicles that can be released the next time an action potential reaches the axon terminal. The entire process repeats each time an action potential reaches the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. 
Thank you to the Professor Ted for that video. I hope that explains it a little bit better. Um, so that's how the messages move through the neuron. Uh, I couldn't explain it any better than that. So here we're looking now is that once we know how messages go through the neurons and between neurons, now we know, well now we have to know, the role of the neuron in memory formation. So Eric Kandel did a study of the sea slug. Okay. Uh, it was called Aplesia, um, and he chose that because it has a very simple nervous system. Okay, now I've got a video that I've found, um, and I'm just going to talk over the top of that video. Okay, so um, that should have enough information for us to be able to explain how all that works. So, okay, so. He chose the aplesia because it has uh, only 20,000 neurons. Our brain has over a billion neurons. Um, and also some of its neurons are visible to the human eye. Okay, so that's, that's really important. So it was easy for him to study the changes in the neuron. So what happened then? Well, he would take a small electrode, which you can see down there, and he would poke the siphon of the uh, aplesia, which is circled there, and it, as a reflex action, it would retract its tail. It would then also retract its gill, okay, so because it thought it was in danger. Now, what does that mean? Well, in terms of learning, what would normally happen is when you poke the siphon, it would send a message to the central nervous system, okay, to say we're in danger. The central nervous system would send a motor uh, message, which would then contract the siphon and also contract the gill. What happened there, you can see on the right, the habituation was that um, over time it learnt, the sea slug learnt that if it was stimulated there was no danger to the siphon. So the message is actually decreased. You can see here how the dendrites grew. Okay. So the neuron changed. On the left, you've got the dendrites, a small amount of dendrites. On the right, you can see how many hundreds more dendrites because the neural pathway needs to be quicker, okay, so that the slug knows that it doesn't have to retract its gill. You've also got here more neurotransmitters were released. There was an increase in neurotransmitters, again, to aid with the pace at which the message was sent through. Overall, what do we call that? We call this long-term potentiation. Okay? And that is where the sorry. And that is where the uh, there has been a change in the neuron so that there is the opportunity in time for that neuron to change, okay, and create a memory, a long-term memory. So long-term potentiation means that there's a structural or a functional change in a neuron which will allow for a long-term memory to be created in the future. Okay? And that's basically all we really need to know. So you can see there, long-lasting strengthening of synaptic connections resulting in enhanced neuron function. Basically, the more we activate a neuron, the more connections it makes, if the pathway is always the same, so we create more dendrites, we create more axons, and therefore it allows the message to move through quicker. Okay, and that is what happens when we learn or when we create a new memory. Okay, so important things to remember how does the neuron work? The parts of the neuron, okay, and then how does a neuron change when we're creating a memory, and how do we know? They're questions that you're going to need to be able to have the answers to. Okay. Um, next, you'll be looking at the hippocampus, the role of the hippocampus. Um, and that video is already live, so um, you can watch that whenever you wish. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye.